Hey folks, good to see some familiar names here. Uh, we're just gonna give it just a couple seconds, let people join in. All right, well, why don't we just get rolling and hopefully some more people join us. Um, thank you again, everybody. We're in the last day of the week for Hawaiian Invasive Species Awareness Month that is focusing on the Val Akua. So again, we're looking into those upper reaches of the mountains and exploring those areas and learning about the invasive species species in there and the work that's happening across the state. I'm really excited today. We have Dr. Lisa Crampton or Callie as she goes. Um, let me just give you a quick introduction about her. Um, she's born and raised in Victoria, BC, moved to the US to pursue a doctoral research in ecology, evolution and conservation biology from the University of Nevada at Reno. Uh, graduated in 2004. Her professional experience in Hawaii has been working for USGS at Kilauea Field Station on Hawaii Island. Um, that's where she analyzed field data on the endangered lace on teal to improve monitoring and management strategies implemented by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Subsequently, for the U.S. Forest Service, she analyzed impacts of recreation on wildlife in the Sierra Nevada before finding her way back to Hawaii in her current capacity. She has been the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project's leader since April 2010, overseeing research into the ecology and conservation of Kauai's endearing native forest birds. Most recently, she is trying to learn everything mosquito in hopes of saving these birds. Um, and we really appreciate having her here and we're really happy that she's back in Hawaii. Um, we're also joined by Cynthia King. She's the state etymologist with Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, so she'll be here for the moderated section when we have some Q&A and, and time to chat more after Callie's presentation. I do have a poll. I've been really bad about doing this. Um, I actually can see everybody that, I know everybody that's here, but I'm just gonna put it out there. So I'm just gonna give it um, just a few, like a minute or so to put this out. So if you could take the time and answer this. So my planning team doesn't get upset. <laughs> I'll just give that a few seconds, just quick questions here. And we're also live streaming to the HISC YouTube page. So um, you guys that have friends that would be really interested in this talk, that'll be posted after this presentation so everybody can view it. Okay, I am gonna end the poll. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Callie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. That was a nice introduction, Chelsea. And one of the best things about learning everything mosquito is that I get to meet new people and hang out more with people that I, I, I formerly didn't hang out with very many much because I was so immersed in the bird world. And now I get to be immersed in the invasive species world with all you folks. Uh, so without further ado, what I want to talk about is this, this big overarching project, uh, Birds Not Mosquitoes, which is as you probably know, an, an effort to control um, mosquitoes to benefit birds. And I just wanna talk about Kauai's role in that, big, that bigger puzzle. So here on Kauai, we still have eight native forest bird species. Six of them are, are honey creepers and are highly susceptible to mosquito-borne diseases. So that's all the brightly colored guys, um, the EEV, the Apapane, the Akake'e, the Anianiao, the Kauai Amakihi, and then this little drab guy, the Akikiki. And then two of them are not honey creepers. Um, the Kauai, uh, small, small Kauai thrush, the Poyohi, is not a honey creeper, and the Kauai Elapayo is also not a honey creeper. Uh, six of these species are endemic to Kauai, found here and nowhere else in the Hawaiian chain. Um, that would be everybody but the Apapane and the EEV. 
And three of these species are listed as endangered, the Puayohi, the Akake'e, and the Akikiki, all with populations well under a thousand individuals. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute. Of course, these species are part of that bigger Hawaiian honey creeper family. This is that lineage that evolved from a single ancestral finch and turned into this wide diversity of beak types and colors that are fulfilling all these important ecological roles throughout the Hawaiian islands. And so it is this bigger group of birds that we are trying to save with the Birds Not Mosquitoes project. And as I said, I'm just gonna to talk today about the role that Kauai's research plays in that. So as you know, there are many threats to the forest birds, but these are pri primarily the invasive species that thus my intersection with the invasive species world. Um, it also uh, consists of major habitat loss and degradation. Some of that is activities like clearing, but a lot of that degradation is due to invasive plants and animals that have moved into our forests, such as Kahili ginger or, uh, or feral pigs. Another main threat that we're really worried about this moment, of course, is rapid ohia death. And I'm sure everyone's gonna hear a lot more about rapid ohia death this month. And then introduced predators like rats like to prey on forest bird nests. And when they do, they take out the eggs and they also take out the female birds. And then finally, the topic of today's talk is introduced mosquito-borne diseases that are principally vectored by the southern house mosquito, Culex quinquefasciatus. So, uh, female Culex mosquitoes transmit avian diseases called avian uh, malaria, which is a blood parasite, and avian pox, which is a virus. The main culprit in these declines for most species is avian malaria. Females only bite, males do not bite, and that's a really important part of our, of our story. Uh, so it's, it's female mosquitoes that we need to target and remove from the population because they are the biting individuals. And when they bite an, a bird that is uninfected after having bitten a bird that is infected with avian malaria, they can transmit that parasite. So in a susceptible honeycreeper species like E. EV, a single bite from an infected mosquito can result in death. This is seen in nine out of 10 E. EV. So it's, it's a really big deal and we believe it's at the root of most of the Hawaiian honey creeper declines because the Hawaiian honey creepers do not share any evolutionary history with avian malaria. They, they evolved in its absence. And so like us being um, not, re not resistant, not immune to COVID, these birds are not resistant to avian malaria. And there's a nexus here with climate change because formerly the relatively cool temperatures in our upper montane areas of these islands, which were once volcanoes, as you all know, were really cool. And both mosquitoes and avian malaria need warm temperatures to complete their life cycle. So up until really recently, most of the islands in Hawaii had uh, a warm area down uh, Makai where the mosquitoes could reproduce. And then a cooler area where the forest birds were safe because neither avian malaria nor uh, uh, the mosquitoes could reproduce. But climate change is encroaching on that habitat making, because it's becoming warmer and warmer in our mountain areas. And so you can see that also in this graph. Um, this shows the difference between what's happening on Kauai and what's happening on say the big island, Hawaii Island, because of the greater elevation of Hawaii Island. So the yellow represents here the mosquito zone where temperatures have always been warm enough for the mosquitoes to reproduce. Plus we've also cleared many of the forests out of these areas. The green zone represents the forested habitat, which has been the habitat for forest birds during their uh, times in the Hawaiian islands. And the yellow line that goes through that green area represents the elevation at which mosquitoes and avian malaria can reproduce or not. So it's sort of that barrier to reproduction that occurs at about 1500 meters in elevation. And so on the big island, it just neatly slices through a lot of the beautiful ohia forests, but there's still lots of ohia forests above that elevation where the birds are doing fine. On Kauai, however, the highest elevations we have on this island are at 1500 meters. So there's very, very little mosquito-free habitat, if any left 
on an island like Kauai. And so we are already seeing the invasion of mosquitoes into the highest elevations. So in this um, slide here, all of these hot spots represent sampling zones for mosquitoes that we conducted in fall of 2020. And this, of course, is the Alakai Plateau up here, which is the highest elevation on Kauai Island. And this here um, represents the range of endangered species such as the Akikiki. And so you can see that the mosquitoes have definitely invaded the plateau, and you can also see that they've begun to invade the range of the Akikiki. And so what we are observing at the same time as we are observing this invasion of mosquitoes is we are observing the freefall of the Akikiki population. So as recently as 2018, we estimated that there were 500 Akikiki on Kauai, and now we think that there are far fewer than 100 individuals. And so there's two couple of lines of evidence for that. One is that we have just shown that um, survival of these of this species in the core of its habitat has dropped off significantly since 2015. And then another way of looking at that is that these are territories in the core of this bird's habitat. Um, back in 2015, when we first started monitoring their territories, there were about 35 territories or 70 birds holding territories, so breeding pairs, you can think of them that way in Halapa'akai, the core of the habitat. And by this year, we had uh, three territories and two breeding pairs, and actually only one of those breeding pairs managed to fledge a nest. So we are now down to less than a handful of individuals at Halapa'akai, where once it was like a booming metropolis for this species. So what we are hoping with the Birds Not Mosquitoes project is that a bacteria named Wolbachia is going to come to the rescue. Wolbachia uh, bacteria occur naturally in insect populations, including mosquitoes, and it is involved in the reproduction, uh, in, su in successful reproduction of mosquitoes. So when uh, males and females with the same strain of Wolbachia breed, then the female's eggs are viable and they hatch into new mosquitoes. However, when males and females have different strains of Wolbachia, the eggs are inviable and do not hatch. So that's shown here. This male has different um, strain of Wolbachia than this female, and so she lays unviable eggs. And so the idea behind the um, Birds Not Mosquitoes project is this, it's called incompatible insect technique. The idea is that we re release enough non-biting males with an incompatible strain of Wolbachia that they usurp all the copulations or as many copulations as possible with wild females such that out there in the wild, wild females are much, much more likely to breed with an incompatible male and thus lay uh, infertile eggs. And so that turns into population um, decline in the mosquito population. And this has been shown to work in many places across the globe where you have your natural population out here, your wild population out here, and you introduce these large cohorts of males with different or incompatible Wolbachia into that environment and the population tanks over time. And they have also documented that as soon as the mosquito population begins to crash, the prevalence of the disease starts to wane as well. So they are definitely linked. And this is our uh, currently one of our best hopes or, or for, uh, for the bird populations. So in order to effectively implement this technique, this, uh, this incompatible insect technique, we need to know a lot about mosquitoes in the wild because you need to know enough to, to figure out when and where you want to release these incompatible males. You want to know how many incompatible males to release. And so on Kauai, for the last couple of years, we've been trying to find mosquito breeding habitat. So that's the left uh, photo over here. And we have been catching adult mosquitoes with both CO2 scent traps, which attract a mis uh, female mosquito looking for a blood meal, and then these oviposition traps, which attract female mosquitoes looking to lay their eggs. And these allow us not only to document where mosquitoes are in time and space and their relative abundance, but they actually are in themselves a small scale control measure because we're removing mosquitoes from the environment. And when we do find larvae in water sources, we can control them with another bacteria called uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. 
and which uh, <clears throat> is eaten by the larvae in the water and causes them to die. And it's very, very, very specific to mosquito and midge larvae and doesn't affect other invertebrates or fish or mammals or birds. So it's very, very safe for use. In fact, you can buy it commercially uh, in your hardware store under the nickname Dunk. And so this is the way we have been trying to get a handle on when and where mosquitoes are. So from 2018 to 2019 with the USGS, we surveyed that core Akikiki breeding habitat for 12 months in a row using 10 pairs of these traps. And then in the fall of 2020, fall is peak mosquito season, we decided that we wanted to know more about the spatial extent of mosquitoes. And so instead of just surveying one site intensively, we spread out our sampling across six sites that represent the range of elevation of forest bird habitat on Kauai. And then on we in 2021 and 2022, we have cherry picked from six of those sites to sample just three of those sites, again, for this longer time period to understand seasonal variation in those populations with eight pairs of traps. So here are some quick results. Um, there are our larval surveys in fall of 2020, which remember that fall is peak mosquito season, um, yielded Culex mosquitoes, the mosquito that's responsible for transmission of avian malaria, really only in two sites, the Camp 10 site, which is Camp 10 Road that penetrates the Alakai from the Koke'e area. Look how many larvae we were finding on some of these surveys, especially in October the second visit up to, to those places. And then we also uh, detected larvae in Kwaikwe stream on the Alakai Plateau of Culex. All the rest of the places we surveyed, this is YLI stream in the Southern Alakai and Kwaye stream in the middle of the Al Alakai. And then Halapakai itself only had 80s mosquitoes and 80s do not, are not very, very competent vectors for avian malaria, although it's possible they can result in some transmission. We are more worried about 80s with their nexus um, with human diseases, but this is also not the species that transmits those human diseases. And so back to the trap data, uh, I have here the two years of data that we have surveyed that core Halapa'akai breeding site for Akikiki. And I just, what I want to draw your attention to here is that in 2018, we started in September, surveyed through the fall, and then had no mosquitoes whatsoever in the middle of the winter and even into the early spring. And then mosquitoes picked up again in the fall. So that was 2018 and 2019. By, in contrast, in 2021, we started surveying in February and basically immediately picked up mosquitoes, continued to track mosquitoes through the spring with a brief res respite again in July, and then ticking upwards as expected in the fall again. So earlier in this talk, I said that peak mosquito breeding season was the fall, but now we are beginning to see two peaks in mosquito breeding, one in spring and one in fall. And this is really bad news for the birds because it basically means that there are mosquitoes present year round. And so we just, and this is also our highest elevation site. So where once upon a time, the birds had a break from mosquitoes, now they basically face an onslaught of mosquitoes year round, even in the highest elevation sites. And so that being said, there are even more mosquitoes at low elevation. So this graph goes in order of lowest elevation at 1,050 meters to the Adhalapakai site at 3, 1,315 meters. So 1050 to 1315 meters. And just look how many more mosquitoes we find in October, especially that really bad month um, at that low elevation site compared to the number of mosquitoes we're finding in the other sites. And so that low elevation site, Camp Tan Road, is this really, really hot spot right here. And then the middle spot, Koke'e, is right here. And then there's the Halapakai spot right there. So in other news, we are learning a lot about which traps uh, mosquitoes are attracted to. So remember that the, the BGs are the host-seeking trap that when mosquitoes are looking for a blood meal using CO2, we track them. And then this GAT is a passive gravid trap for mosquitoes that are just looking to lay their eggs. And the GT is an active gravid trap also for mosquitoes that are looking to lay their eggs that have already had that blood meal. And really the vast majority of females that we catch uh, are in those active traps for the blood seeking females. 
The important thing here is this axis. Look at the difference. 125 on the y-axis versus 15 versus four. So even though the slopes of the lines look kind of similar, we are catching an order of magnitude more mosquitoes in, mm -hmm. um, in some places in those host-seeking traps, which is important for us to know about the biology of the mosquito and how to target the mosquito. The other thing that we are noticing is, a, uh, as expected, because these are mosquitoes, is that the mosquito abundance is strongly correlated with the um, TWI index, which is an index of sort of how much water pools on the landscape, sort of a flatness so index, and with temperature, unsurprisingly, such that we expect to catch uh, all of those things being equal, three more mosquitoes in a BG trap on the streams than we do on the ridges. And so that's unsurprising, but it's good to document what you hypothesis and expect. So how do we use all this information that I've just shown you, all these differences in temporal and spatial dynamics and differences between trap types? Well, first of all, it helps us plan our trapping. We know when and where and what kinds of traps we should be using to find mosquitoes. It helps us estimate the size of the release cohort because we can use these relationships between those predictor variables like TWI and temperature to estimate densities of mosquitoes across the landscape. And we're working on that really actively with our colleague Adam Bersino at Fish and Wildlife Service. We can also use this information to target the timing and location of releases of these IIT, these incompatible males in space um, and time. Sorry, I left off the word time there. Um, so would we target more heavily or larger cohorts for streams, or would we target more mosquitoes for spring and fall than we would for those summer months or that February time period where we still don't really see a lot of mosquitoes. And we can also use these correlations to predict mosquito abundance beyond the areas that we have actively surveyed. So we can basically put, use this to sort of make a map of a predictive map of where we expect to find mosquitoes in the Alakai but also any other areas that share a similar climate space. So areas on Maui or the big island that would have a similar climate space, we can make a prediction of how many mosquitoes we might find in those areas, which could be important to targeting management at the statewide level. The other thing that all these surveys are doing is they're providing a baseline survey against which we can monitor the effectiveness of the IIT, Birds Not Mosquitoes uh, program when we release it, we can, this is telling us what the state of mosquitoes are now. And so we can say after we've released 10 or 20 or 50 cohorts of IIT mosquitoes, we can resample all these places in the Alakai and say, have we succeeded in knocking out back mosquito populations? And then of course, as I alluded earlier, identifying all these larval sources is allowing us to manually treat them and try to put some control measures on the landscape while we await the rollout of the IIT mosquitoes in the next couple of years. So this is letting us apply that BTI, that dunk to larval sources in the Alakai. I wanna just leave you with some thoughts about what you can do, because there is a lot you can do. First of all, it's just really important to attend talks such as this one to stay informed and, and then get involved. And getting involved is letting your neighbors and your friends and your neighborhood group or your scout troop or whatever know about what's going on with the birds, what we have, what plans we have for the mosquitoes and letting them know what this Wolbachia tool means and doesn't mean. Uh, we in Kauai are currently seeking volunteers, citizen scientists to help us track down those larval sources and control them. And then of course, every little bit that you do in your individual life or in your political life to address the threat of climate change is at the end of the day, what's gonna save these birds. So I'd like you to just think that there's, there's something everyone can do anywhere they are, even if they're in Finland or Greece or Namibia, wherever they happen to be, there's something everyone can do to help save the birds. And then around here in Hawaii, around where you live, around your cabin in Puke'e, if you happen to have one, or if you, are camping up in upcountry Maui or anywhere you might be, if you have a ranch in upcountry Big Island, really just think about the fact that Culex breed in stagnant water. And so it's on us to make sure that we don't let stagnant water lie. Um, and it can be even like this much. So let me give you an idea of the things that breed um, mosquitoes that we have seen in and around our homes and in Koke'e 
and other places, tarps, tires, wheelbarrows, bucket lids. It doesn't even have to be the full bucket. The little dish below your plant. We have found larvae in all of these things. So please, um, please help us by making sure that you're not leaving things out there that collect water and then collect uh, mosquito larvae. And so I'm just gonna wrap up acknowledging the fact that the Birds Not Mosquitoes uh, program is a huge, huge, huge partnership with many, many agencies, not-for-profits, some companies, universities, all working together to try to attack this problem in a concerted ma manner. So my hats off and my many, many mahalos to all of my partners in, in this effort that have helped us learn what we're learning about mosquitoes and are pushing this project forward. And um, thank you all also to, to you for attending today and being here to hear a little bit more about how we can save our forest birds. Thanks. Right on, thanks so much, Callie. Um, so please go feel free, put um, any questions in the chat box, in the Q&A. Um, if you missed the introduction earlier, uh, Callie runs the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project. We're also joined by Cynthia King. She is the state entomologist with Department of Land and Natural Resources. And Lainey Berry um, is also joining it joining us. She's the wildlife manager for Division of Forestry and Wildlife. So we can ask really hard questions if we want to, because we have the right people in the room. <laughs> um, and that's an adorable picture to, to leave with. Um, maybe while people are typing into the chat, I, I have a question. I mean, what are the biggest challenges with moving this project forward and, and getting Walbachia out there? And, and saving the birds, because like you, those maps you showed, I mean, it's happening now. Mosquitoes are in these areas already. I think maybe I should let Cynthia or Lainey tackle that, because it actually comes down, I think, more to policy and regulation and, and the state of the science than what we're doing with the birds. Sure, I can take a stab at that. Um, I, I, there are a lot of hurdles on a lot of different fronts, including um, actually developing the tool, the approach itself um, for Hawaii, um, having an incompatible mosquito that we can use on the landscape. Um, right now, we're, we've, we've, we, that tool exists. So it's, um, and actually there are a couple different options that we have to pursue it, but um, right now, both of those options are on the mainland. And so one of the um, steps that we have to take is to re-import um, this mosquito that was that was that we actually sent to the mainland from Hawaii from um, local populations um, to get the incompatible Wolbachia. Um, we have to bring that mosquito back in and, and across sort of the um, regulatory um, at the state level uh, permit uh, and compliance um, check boxes for for doing that. And then we also because um, Ultimately, the Wolbachia inside the mosquito is considered a biopesticide. So it's actually going to be regulated um, like a biopesticide by the EPA. And so we're going to have to be uh, following all of the correct processes through the EPA to make sure that, um, that they have the data that they need to appropriately label the product. And in the event that uh, we would like to request an emergency exemption to use this because it is such a dire situation in advance of that, then we're going to have to provide a justification and, um, and some basic safety data, actually working in partnership with the collaborators on the mainland to provide that safety data. And then once we do check all those boxes, we still have to um, you know, have boots on the ground and money for implementation and operations. And while we do have um, the ability to sort of disperse mosquitoes by hand using personnel. Um, it's a big area. Um, you, you, you saw the map that Callie put out there, and there are a lot of areas um, that are going to be in, uh, in need of using this approach. And so um, sort of investing in additional uh, deployment technologies um, will be a, a, another very costly component of this. So there, there are a lot of different things that we need to tackle. They're not impossible. And we have a really wonderful group of people working towards that. So I can, I'm happy to go into further details, but I know that was already kind of a long-winded answer. No, I mean, it's complicated. You know, the regulatory 
uh, hurdles that you have to go through. And then, I mean, funding needs are a common theme throughout these talks and in trying to save species. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat and I know uh, this is supposed to end at 1.30, but I'm always happy to stay over for a good discussion um, as long as everybody else um, on our panel can. And if you do need to leave, no problem. Um, wow, we got some great questions. Okay, first one, are there any other treatment methods in the early stages of testing? So maybe something other than Wolbachia that you're using, or um, I know you talked about the traps, Callie. So anybody that wants to take that. I can take a first stab. So one of the things we are looking at doing is exploring methods to um, distribute BTI more efficiently. So can we use other tools like helicopters or something else to, to spread this into the larval sources along um, in, in mosquito habitat in the alakai? Um, so that's one thing we're beginning to look at. But really at this point, the tools available to us are um, BTI and then traditional things like turning over water sources and filling the holes in the road. So we've worked really closely with Kauai Dofa to address that Camp 10 road because all the rots and, ruts and potholes in it were major breeding sources for mosquitoes. And so we, there's, you know, tr everyone knows the tried and true things even for keeping mosquitoes out of their yard. So we, we're, we're looking into all those things to try and keep it at bay. I don't know if there's other ones in the R&D stage, maybe Cynthia Laney wants to talk about that. No, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I think that the landscape scale mosquito control using Wolbachia is the number one priority right now. And then certainly an existing tool like BTI, the bacteria, the naturally occurring bacteria that Kelly mentioned that can be, be used safely for the, the larval, the immature stages is, is another option. We don't think it will be as effective, but it, it might be just an intermediate step that we can use um, in the meantime. And, and this is just a, a question that kind of follow, falls into that. Um, is there any way of making native birds immune or resistant to avian malaria? There's, there, has, there is some ongoing research um, by US Geological Survey looking at resistance uh, in the genes of native birds um, and that could could be used as a method of, um, you know, selecting species for a captive breeding program, for example, to um, promote, you know, the resistance. Um, you know, certainly in some Hawaiian honey creepers, there's some populations that are, you know, surviving at lower elevation in the presence of mosquitoes and avian malaria, such as Hawaii amakihi. Um, and, the, you know, the Hawaiian honey creepers are you know, closer related. So it would, it's going to be very interesting to see the results of the, um, those studies. Oh, that's great. Um, just two more questions. So, you know, how about public pushback with uh, Wolbachia and, you know, how people might associate that with gene modification? I can take a quick stab. Um, I know one of the reasons that we're excited to do talks like this, and even just earlier this month, I presented at the IAA neighborhood board and the Pearl City neighborhood board meeting. It's a great opportunity to get ahead of any miscommunications like that um, because this project doesn't involve any, um, any work that has to do with uh, genetic modification or gene drive or things that, that I know are of concern to, to communities and, and, to, and to folks, um, not just in Hawaii. And so, yeah, just getting ahead of the curve. And what we found is um, generally the public and those who are able to, to hear about the project are really supportive. Um, and that's you know one of the things I heard at the last neighborhood board meeting was, well, gosh, if we had heard that there might be a mosquito facility coming into our area and we hadn't heard anything else about it, that would have been you know confusing and, and concerning. But after you did this presentation, we totally support this. How can we help? And so I'm not saying that I think every single person across the state will have that same sentiment, but I think folks that have the opportunity to to hear what it is that we're trying to do, to see see this little face in front of us and the reason that we're trying to do it. Um, mostly we've had really overwhelming support, which is, which is really positive. 
Yeah, that's really great. And it's great to have all the folks that are working on this project giving these presentations. Um, I'm going to give uh, one more question. And then I think Lainey, Callie, um, Cynthia, you can see the last question in there. If somebody maybe wants to type an answer, um, we're just pretty much out of time. So I'm going to leave it on um, how about a timeline of when we can expect to release these incompatible mosquitoes on Kauai? Um, and then if maybe Let's, some can take on <laughs> Kona's. There you go. Let's, luckily, I have, a, I have a slide to that very point. <laughs> I anticipated this. So um, right now where we're at is 2022. And as many of you know, an EA to investigate this is underway on Maui, and we are in the early, early stages of an environmental assessment on Kauai to scope out this project on Kauai. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lini and Cynthia, is that field tests probably on Maui will occur in 2023, and then um, the first releases on Kauai would be 2024. Is that approximately right? I think that that was sort of the consensus um, based on a lot of folks that are participating in this project and doing the planning. The, these dates are estimates that, you know, sort of optimistic or, or realistic estimates for when we think that that might be able to move forward. But I will note that this time frame has changed a number of times um, since this project started. And it's um, the faster we can get it done, though, the faster we can help the birds. Um, but th there are a lot of a lot of steps we still need to, to take. Right, and, and and I just want to add, this is dependent on a lot of things, you know, the, the regulatory process, including the environmental assessments and the, you know, the public comment um, and the EPA registration process. And most of all, you know, the funding, this is not a cheap um, tool to develop and implement. And the other thing is that it, this is a, you know, this control method is not an eradication uh, it's a suppression and it will it'll only work if mosquitoes are released continuously. Uh, like if the, you know, the, the tool is, the, the male mosquitoes is re released continuously to suppress breeding in the wild populations. As soon as we stop releasing male mosquitoes, the wild populations will uh, bounce back. So this is, um, it's, it's very important to make this clear that we you know this is not a tool that you know, we can't eradicate mosquitoes, not on, you know, not on these main islands. Um, it's just not capable. It might be possible on a much smaller island, um, but not, not in the main Hawaiian islands. Yeah, thanks so much, Lainey, for, for answering that. And, and that is like a really good point. A lot of invasive species control work takes ongoing funding and resources. So things don't blow up out of control again. Um, Oh, sorry. So maybe I'll just, I, don't, I hate leaving questions unanswered. So I'm just going to give you guys this one. Um, uh, is there any plans to participate with bioengineers with gene editing for mosquitoes and even perhaps other detrimental invasive species affecting native birds, such as um, rodents in Hawaii? Uh, I can take a quick stab at that. Right now, DLNR, um, we don't have any plans to participate in that work. Um, but I know that there is really interesting and innovative work that's um, being researched all over the U.S. Um, to target different pest species of public health concern and, and even some endangered species. So it's something that, um, you know, that, it, it, that might be something that we look at in the future. Uh, but right now, our immediate focus is, is absolutely the Wolbachia-based um, incompatible insect technique. Yeah, thanks for answering that, Cynthia. And thanks for joining us. We're pretty, yeah, we're out of time, but I really appreciate everybody staying on 10 minutes extra to have some great conversation and discussion around this. And I definitely know this is not gonna be the, the last presentation about this topic as things continue to move forward and, and saving our forest birds. Um, so thank you, Callie, so much for the presentation. Um, great seeing you. Thanks, Cynthia and Lainey for joining us. Again, uh, this will be posted onto our HISC uh, 
Hi Sam 2022 webpage, the recording. So feel free to reference it or send it out to your friends. And that's where all of our webinars get, are going to be. I just put a link uh, to our full schedule because next week we move into Valkanaka um, and that's looking at you know, our community and maybe more invasive species that you're familiar with because it's in that landscape that we all exist in. Um, so again, aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. And until next week, hui ho. Thank you. Thanks for organizing. Yeah. Thanks.